leader and members of Flag Australia and myself are hearing on a regular basis about the pressure that our farmers and uh, food producers are under. But let me just make the point that um, these policies come from a faraway place. And you're going to have to bear with me now for a few minutes while I read my speech. And I will read it because otherwise I'll be up here for hours. I get a bit carried away with this, so I've contained it to uh, as smaller um, speech as I can do. But we are in trouble and um, we all need to pull together on this. And first of all, I'd just like to thank um, people who have been supporting Flag Australia in their push to get this word out there at Leon Biner on his Don't Sell Australia Short Facebook campaign, who has now over seven and a half thousand members, uh, all concerned about the same thing. Sean Perry from 5AA Talkback, who has allowed Peter and myself uh, many, many times to go on there uh, for hours at a time uh, to get these issue issues aired and discussed and uh, we'll actually be having Lord Monckton on there tomorrow night from seven o'clock till midnight so that people can ring in, ask questions and uh, have a discussion about this. So 5AA um, have been behind us, which is great. And also the Southern Argus newspaper. Uh, they have been so supportive of getting the message out there of the stress that our primary producers are under and uh, we really can't thank all of those people enough. So now I'll start to read. Uh, again, thank you all for, for coming here today. I also thank the many people behind the scenes who have helped to educate me on the global issues and how they are being implemented at a state level so that I can be an effective uh, elected member of your parliament. And while I'm speaking to you today, uh, I'm going to quote a number of people from various influential positions uh, on the international stage. And I'll leave it with you to make up your mind uh, if you want to continue to head in the direction that we're going. I first stumbled across Agenda 21 uh, in about 2008. And quite frankly, my first uh, re reaction was to dismiss what I was reading because I didn't believe that any government in Australia would take us down this road. Then I began to see um, a legislative pattern emerging in Parliament, which concerned me greatly. And I also started to see the tenor of legislation that we were passing. I did air those concerns in Parliament and it was dismissed and ignored. Um, the words, Agenda 21, ladies and gentlemen, were never meant to be spoken. And if they were, then of course it would be dismissed as a conspiracy theory. Because if people knew Agenda 21 and what it stood for, there's plenty of information out there where they could actually learn uh, what the end game was and governments didn't want that to be known. My dad always said to me that people only lie for two reasons. One reason is because you're ashamed of what you're doing, and the second reason is that you don't want people uh, to be warned just before you screw them. And I honestly believe that these secrets have been, thank you, <laughs> that these secrets have been kept um, for both of those reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, the origins of the environmental movement as we see it began back in 1968 when the Club of Rome was formed. The Club of Rome has been described as a crisis think tank which specialises in crisis creation. The main, purpose of this, mm, the main purpose of this think tank was to formulate a crisis that would unite the world and condition us to the idea of global solutions to local problems. In a document called The First Global Revolution, authored by Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, on pages 104 and 105, it stated, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers, of course, will be caused by human intervention that will require a global response. That's the origin of global warming, ladies and gentlemen. 
In 1975, Australia agreed to bring in a new economic order via the Lima Declaration on the second conference of the United Nations Industrial Development Organisation. The outcome of this was, as I said, the Lima Declaration, which was the blueprint for the redeployment of tools, jobs and manufacturing to the developing nations, leaving countries like Australia short of technology, a manufacturing base and jobs. Blind Freddy can now see what the outcome of that has been for our country with their unworkable trade and tariffs agreements hand in hand with this that have followed as a matter of course. This is now a reality with around 90% of our agriculture and manufacturing just gone. Australia signed the Lima Declaration in a, and hundreds of others with the support of all major political players. Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Keating, Hewson, Howard, Rudd, the Democrats, the Greens and even the Nationals. It has been put to me that all of these treaties were the foundation for the rollout of Agenda 21 and it seems that Australia has been moved around the global chessboard and our so-called leaders were either complicit or naive to the long-term consequences. And now we're almost a checkmate. Sorry. In 1992, former President of the United States, George Bush Senior said, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a, a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action will be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. Cutting through the code, I want everyone to consider what the words profound reorientation of all human society and unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources actually means. For everyone here tonight not familiar with Agenda 21, I would suggest that this is the beginning of your learning curve, not the end. In 1992, Maurice Strong, Secretary General of the UN Earth Summit and member of the Club of Rome said, it is clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, consumption of large amounts of frozen and convenience foods, use of fossil fuels, ownership of motor vehicles, small electrical appliances, home and air workplace air conditioning and suburban housing are not sustainable. Put those statements together with the previous one and it must become clear that Agenda 21 is about controlling every aspect of our lives, how we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, how we move around, food production, the amount of food and where we even live. Dixie Ray, former Washington State Governor and Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs stated, Agenda 21 seeks to establish a mechanism for transferring the wealth from citizens to the third world. Fear of environmental crisis would be used to create a world government and UN central direction. From a report in the 1976 UN's Habitat One conference, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, therefore contributes to social injustice. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you work hard, and you exercise good financial management and invest in property, you are contributing to social injustice. In a report from the President's Council on Sustainable Development, we need a new collaborative decision process that leads to better decisions, more rapid change, and more sensible use of human, natural, and financial resources in achieving our goals. 
and at the same time, Harvey, Harvey Reuven, Vice Chair of the Wildlands Project says, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. J. Gary Lawrence, advisor to President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development. Participating in a UN advocated planning process would very likely bring out many of the conspiracy fixated groups and individuals in our society, and here we are. This segment of our society who fear one world government and UN invasion through which our individual freedoms will be stripped away would actively work to defeat any elected official who joined the conspiracy by undertaking Agenda 21. So we will call our process something else. We will call it comprehensive planning or growth management or smart growth. We ended up with sustainable development. The redeployment of human and financial resources has now become visible to us all via the cut to services and programs to assist the sick, the young, the elderly, and of course the creation of another level of poverty now identified by the term the working poor. I was speaking to a person last week and he said to me, if Hitler was still around, he'd be sitting back thinking, I didn't need bullets for a global takeover. And he'd be right. We see daily cash grabbing via new taxes called levies, supposedly because we are cash strapped in this state, and at the same time see big project spending that does not fit with the message that we are in financial crisis. But we the people have to tighten our belt while the government seems absolutely unaware and unconcerned of the amount of debt that it is accumulating. This in turn means that taxes, levies, fines and other penalties increase as well as the cost of living rising exponentially and the ordinary citizen's ability to exist well is compromised with almost every law that we pass. We're constantly paying for so-called services that we don't receive. This is wealth re redistribution at the grassroots level, redeployment of financial resources, ensuring only hardship for the citizens who just really want to get on with their lives. The parliament has also ventured into the rights of people to own and retain their property and manage it without government interference. In particular, the laws around, as Peter said, water allocation, natural resource management, the Native Vegetation Act, Development and Planning Act, which are all equally toxic to our food producers as they are to our long-term security, we city dwellers. Everyone needs to remember, we all pay a natural resource management levy on our tax rates. So this is not just going to affect the food producers, the intrusions into our property that Peter was talking about that land producers are going through will roll out into the suburbs and into the city because they have the authority to do that. We all have already fiddled in Parliament with land titles of people in rural areas. And I'm talking about the Barossa and McLaren Vale uh, legislation that passed. And the word used to judge the buzzwords used to justify that was heritage status. At the same time that our right to own and manage our land, have access to water, produce adequate food to ensure that our only option is not to consume often toxic and substandard food from places like China. This government has been working overtime to take away our rights to common law through many pieces of legislation. Common law is what guarantees us an ability to correct injustices. This coming year, I promise you, you will also hear debate over a number of pieces of legislation that will further erode our common law rights. And you have to get behind me on this, ladies and gentlemen, to stop this from going through. As Agenda 21 became more and more apparent to me, I began using the line in Parliament, the government was now declaring war on its own citizens. And that goes back as far as 2008. This, of course, led me to being labelled a conspiracy theorist. But here we are now, openly talking about Agenda 21 and the ramifications we will see in a short period of time if this is not stopped in its tracks. Let me just say that I often hear we cannot stop what is happening. Two-party preferred system, vote Labor, vote Liberal, eh, what does it matter? 
And in fact, that's probably true for the House of Assembly because that's where government's formed. But ladies and gentlemen, here in South Australia, we have the Legislative Council, the House of Review. And my friends, that is where the true power does lie. And the last thing that governments want you to understand is that no matter who is in power, the Legislative Council is there for checks and balances. And when the Legislative Council isn't overly influenced by the major parties, legislation can be blocked. Remember, on most of these policies that I've spoken about here today, there has been bipartisan support for everything that has gone through. When the major parties join together, then the crossbenchers and minor parties, uh, basically our vote is null and void. The way to avoid that is to make sure that when the major parties do join together, they don't have the numbers. For way too long now, we the people have been asleep at the wheel and it is time to wake up and participate in the democratic process. And to do that, you need to understand the parliamentary and political system that you are trying to rein in. In 1972, the Club of Rome published the alarmist limits to growth document, warning of worldwide overpopulation, the need for sustainable development. This was the beginning of the slow process of social engineering and programming people to accept that the planet is struggling to sustain life. On the 8th of October 1973, the New York Times reported a quote from Ted Turner, also Club of Rome, the social experiment in China under Chairman Mao, under Chairman Mao's leadership, is one of the most important and successful in human history. In 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev, also a member of Club of Rome, said, we are moving toward a new world order, the world of communism, and we shall never turn off that road. He also quoted in 1996 Monetary and Economic Review on page five, the environmental crisis will be the international disaster that will unlock the new world order one world government. In 1992 came the Earth Summit, which produced the document called the Earth Charter. This document was co-written by Maurice Strong, longtime globalist, elitist, member of Club of Rome, and Mikhail Gorbachev. Both Strong and Gorbachev stated that it was hoped that this document would be adopted as the new Ten Commandments. With, the environmental, with environmentalism as the new one world religion. Out of this summit came Agenda 21. Ted Turner, who was also a member of the Club of Rome, was quoted as saying in 1996, the total population of 250 to 300 million people is ideal. That means a reduction of 95% from present levels would be even more ideal. Anyone who abhors the China one-child policy is simply a dum-dum. In 1998, the Baltimore Sun reported on July the 7th, most of Ted Turner's first donation to the UN of 22 million went to programs that seek to stall population. Another goal of the depopulation process is that the upcoming generation will submit to sterilization to save Mother Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, everything I've said here tonight can be verified by document searches. And it is now time for us all to take off our blinkers and encourage our neighbours to take off their blinkers. And it's also time for you to demand that every person you elect fully understands this policy that is being rolled out via local, state and federal government at a concerning rate. We're not talking about decades, we're talking about only years before this is fully implemented. And every day another law is passed, to in, is introduced to produce the end game of Agenda 21 being fully implemented. So the question that Lord Monckton asks, carbon tax, climate change, and Agenda 21, can democracy survive all three, needs to be answered and answered now. And you need to find out from your elected members what they know of Agenda 21. And if they don't know it, educate them. And if they don't know it, 
then push them to understand what they are voting on in Parliament, because this is crossroads. I thank you all very much for your time and for your attention, and uh, I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce Lord Christopher Monckton. Thank you.